Let's have a chin wag and let's talk about Chile. Let's end in Latin America with a bit of hope to end the year on and maybe something that we can look forward to doing in our own way in Britain or certainly in solidarity with the people of Latin America. So I'm going to look at what next um, by Alvarado. We, we're pulling up an article that's uh, linked in the comments here. But uh, please do go ahead and read it. And as I say, there will be in January, there'll be a film coming out. So on the 25th of October 2020, Chile's people voted by a crushing margin to support the writing of a new constitution and to do so through the election of a new constitutional convention. This was an overwhelming defeat of the Chilean government, which had initially sought to amend the existing 1980 constitution, inherit, which was inherited by, from the Pinochet dictatorship, and then to have a new constitution written by the parliament they do, do, dominate. The Chilean left has always rejected the, legit, the legitimacy of Pinochet's 1980 constitution. In fact, the entire opposition rejected it until the mid 1980s, when US efforts to support a quote unquote democratic transition began. Pulling together regime and opposition moderates meant pulling apart the broader opposition, and gradually the situation changed until eventually only the communists and various smaller groups maintained their outright hostility to the constitution. Accepting the dictatorship's constitution and to never again attempt a popular unity type of government, the political coalition led by Socialist President Salvador Allende from 1970 to 1973, uh, that was the popular unity type government, was the price paid for a return to power within a highly restricted democracy. We left them bound, well bound, noted Pinochet smugly. So, um, Nick, I see what we're going to do. We're just going to play a little trailer from your thing and then I'm going to bring you in for some questions. This is just a little one minute trailer. It looks boss. I'm excited. Let's slap it up, Vicky, and uh, beat the audience. Somos los amores de Escabuchado. Somos los amores de Escabuchado. Nos conocimos aquí luchando, resistiendo y ahí para que vean que esta weá fue de los tan luchos. Right, Nick, uh, as we know each other a little bit, I, I'm yeah. proud chair of the Media Fund and we support independent media and we couldn't be happier to be uh, talking to you today and promoting this film. And we want to promote all the great work that independent media does. That, that uh, And when we talk about independent media, we're talking about independent from external factors, uh, independence of funding. So we're not necessarily replicating the voices of the already powerful. So in that light, Tell us about what this film is about, what your personal experiences are, mm. and, and what you've learned about the situation in Chile um, <clears throat> that, that you're going to be sharing with the audience. Okay, so first thing first, uh, the film, the trailer is mine. That's the first time I've shown it. So this is a, a big moment for me. Um, the article that you read from is not my article. That's by one of our contributing editors, an Alvarado contributing editor, Victor Figueroa Clark. Uh, who's got an excellent book on Salvador Allende as well, uh, published by Pluto. So please do check that out. So, um, yeah, so my experience with Chile is basically that I lived there for four years from 2010 until 2014. So I got to know um, a lot of uh, the kind of economic model, the political situation, and many of the, the tensions which um, exist in Chilean society, uh, largely as a product of the ongoing legacy of the dictatorship, um, which is also, you know, profoundly impacts the, the economic model. Um, Chile was often presented uh, and did a good job of presenting itself from a kind of elite perspective as the success story of Latin America. You know, it has high GDP, 
relatively low uh, poverty poverty by by regional standards um, um, and um, you know <laughs> the the Pinochet uh, era is obviously a fairly large rupture but aside from those kind of brutal horrific 17 18 years um, Chile has been largely stable politically um, However, despite all this kind of way it likes to present itself, you know, there's, there are all kinds of social tensions and political tensions in Chile, um, many to do with the dictatorship, as I already said, you know, the fact that uh, this dictatorship murdered and tortured and exiled so many people and there's been very, very little, uh, very, very little accountability for the people behind that. Um, but also ongoing issues uh, with Chile's indigenous population, uh, the Mapuche, uh, which is, um, you know, over a million people in a country of around 17 million. So it's a sizable, a sizable component of the country. Um, but as a product of the, uh, the neoliberal system imposed under Pinochet, um, had seen uh, traditional lands um, appropriated for resource extraction, timber, uh, farming, and also for private estates and so forth. Uh, conflicts with the student movement, um, the the military regime, um, you know, as we've already had Milton Freeman mentioned, and we've already discussed uh, how it was the kind of pioneering uh, economic model for neoliberalism, you know, the, the, the big, big expression that people were using a lot uh, when I was there this time last year, December 2019. So it was two, a couple of months after the protests had began, um, was the, the, the very popular expression was that uh, neoliberalism was born in Chile and it's going to die in Chile. Mm. Um, so, you know, people are very familiar with a lot of that. But also one thing that people tend to perhaps overlook when, you know, we, we a lot of people know about Allende, they know about Pinochet. The dictatorship ended in 1990, okay, like formally ended in 1990. What What is talked about less is kind of like the transition, the restoration of elections, which is sometimes called the return of democracy. Um, but that democracy was a very restricted and controlled um, situation. And, th and that transition from Pinochet's regime back to elections, you know, I, I, or a restricted democracy, um, was, uh, was basically the terms of that were set by the outgoing military regime. OK, and this those terms were partly set through the 1980 Constitution, which you've which you've discussed already from that article. Um, and that constitution was imposed by the military regime, very, very illegitimate in the sense that the majority of society was excluded. You know, it's a regime that only came into power through extreme state violence, state terrorism, the murder of thousands of people, uh, trade unionists, environmental activists, political activists, community leaders, student leaders, uh, and so forth. You know, people who were perceived to be organizers in their communities, uh, people who were perceived to have political voices and be influential uh, were obviously those most targeted. So this constitution um, embedded the economic model. It ensured that the uh, the wealth, the consolidation of wealth um, and the concentration of wealth uh, within the elites, the business elites and the political elites, who obviously there's a lot of crossover there, um, it ensured that that wealth would stay in their hands, you know, regardless of elections, regardless of what political party was in power. They'd had a terrible scare under Allende. Allende had, uh, from 1970 to 1973, had invested massively in society, had, um, you know, uh, broken up private states, had nationalised industry, uh, and had really sought to redistribute uh, wealth and political uh, political power, um, you know, in 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 society. So, so that restoration of elections in 1990 occurred under. A system whereby the economic model was entrenched, um, and the, the the elected governments, which then followed that, uh, were more or less happy. They never challenged that. They were happy with the anti-trade union laws. Uh, they were happy with the anti-environmental laws. They were happy to keep imposing the anti-terrorism laws, almost uniquely in cases of Mapuche activism. Um, so, for example, there's been a quite intense conflict going on since the late 90s uh, in southern Chile in the traditional Mapuche lands. Um, where the state has used very, very uh, intense authoritarian uh, methods to to control the situation, and you know, several several Mapuche activists have been killed over the years, uh, murdered, disappeared, and so forth. The the state's unique 
virtually unique use of a law drafted under Pinochet, an anti-terrorism law, has been used uh, in cases of in Mapuche cases. But this could be for something like burning a logging company's vehicle, a lorry, you know, burning a lorry, which is a case of arson, perhaps, um, but could now be treated as terrorism. You know, so that's an example of how the uh, the Pinochet's model continues to persist in society today. Now, on top of that. Uh, well, you know, we've got the privatization that occurred under Pinochet, but it's continued ever since of, you know, education, health, things that we're familiar with in many parts of the world, water, pensions, which have massively um, constricted people's living conditions, have made social mobility virtually impossible and, you know, have kept getting more and more squeezed as wealth gets ever more concentrated in the in the in the dominant class. Um, so, uh, you know, that's gone on until today. And it has been consolidated through a security apparatus, uh, a militarized, a heavily militarized police force, which has seen virtually zero reform since the days of Pinochet and was, you know, a fundamental part of Pinochet's uh, regime. So and that's also in the that's also enshrined in the Constitution, uh, the ability that the states is legitimized to shut down dissent. So all of these issues have been going on ever since, you know. So while people say, you know, democracy came back and so forth, it's, uh, you know, these 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 conditions have persisted ever since. And essentially, you know, and it's just people have got more and more tired. Obviously, post-2008, uh, the capitalist model has become more and more illegitimate in the eyes of so many people. Um, and, you know, political... Systems have depended more and more on authoritarian methods to, to preserve their to preserve their benefits and their privileges. So that's kind of the situation. And uh, in October last year, um, a, a minor rise, a, a really minor rise of you know less than 10p on on transport fares on metro fares in Santiago. Um, but 10p there is you know bearing in mind that a lot of people earn you know three three or four hundred pounds a month, the equivalent of so it's, it's you know it's quite major. Um, in response to this rise, students, high school students, organized a mass fair evasion, which is a form of peaceful protest, uh, obviously, and involved, you know, school kids and then some people who followed them uh, just rushing the metro en masse, jumping the gates and, and, and occupying the platforms. OK, so, I mean, that's, that's it's a form of protest. Now, rather than engage with that, the government of Sebastian Piñera, whose brother was a minister under Pinochet, who is a out and out, you know, he, he tries to hide it these days, but his, Pinera is a, is a keen Pinochet supporter and always has been. Um, rather than engage with that, the, the state chose to use extreme force, uh, brutalizing school kids. And, you know, this went viral. And rather than shut it down as, and crush the protest as Pinera intended to do, he, he basically, you know, he threw petrol on what was already a, a, a very volatile, potentially volatile situation. And, and the country just exploded, um, and and uh, this led to a state of emergency declared by the government, which brought the military back onto the streets for the first time since the regime. So you can imagine there's still a lot of trauma in the country around what happened. Um, some, you know, metro stations were burned. Uh, I used the passive voice there deliberately because that's the culprit is not exactly clear, but this provided the legitimacy for the state to put the troops. Uh, the soldiers back on the streets, you know, bearing in mind this is a country that had a very violent military dictatorship, curfews and so forth. So I was there just a few weeks after this began um, to make this film, um, which basically involved, you know, just being out, being out on the streets because it was everywhere. I've never, you know, I've not been in any a situation quite like that. In, and uh, even having lived in Chile for four years and being aware of these, 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 uh, these tensions that exist, but um, even having watched it on TV and stuff, or TV, you know, on social media, wherever, seen the clips and read a lot about it and spoken to people out there, the sheer scale of it was was really quite impressive. And um, and yeah, I mean, it, it dominated, and it was it was built in a huge, huge grassroots movement uh, that goes way beyond party politics, way beyond the you know the electoral system. And I think that was that was one of the most kind of impacting things, particularly as I happened to be there uh, on the twelfth of December last year. As, as our election results came in and I was sat in a traffic jam in 35 degree heat, getting the, uh, getting the uh, exit poll come through, you know, trying not to become Michael Douglas in falling down 
Um, but um, but yeah, to be there, that was quite a good antidote. It was quite a good antidote to be there and to see, look, you know, this is a system where all the political parties, because they colluded, you know, they colluded the um, in the in the sort of maintenance of this of these privileges of a system which marginalized huge huge parts of the population so the political electoral system is largely discredited um in chile so what they've achieved in in this constitutional vote uh was done without any you know major input from political parties it is a purely grassroots movement i've seen a question just come up about people's assemblies you know something perhaps we could look at going forward um across you know there was something like 400 when I was there, uh, an estimate of community assemblies of just communities coming together. Um, and then, you know, there was a central uh, committee um, uh, and just, you know, to, to discuss the, what needed to be done, what was happening in their community, where they were going, what this was about. So it was built in this massive grassroots democracy. Um, and as I said, it went far beyond pol parliamentary politics. And I think that was a, that was what that was one of the most striking uh one of the most striking um characteristics of everything that's been going on there that's incredible um and i wish we had more time if i'd have been a better host we'd have got in even deeper but the good news for the audience is that there's going to be a film coming out in january where can they find it so we um yeah so santiago rising uh, is a documentary that i've made um for alborada films which is uh you know part of the alborada uh, family. Um, it's our independent documentary uh, film production uh, um, outfit. So yeah, we've got our uh, premiere on the 14th of January. Um, I think there's an Eventbrite link somewhere, um, which is, should be around. Uh, it'll be online, sadly, you know, dream of doing it in a, in a venue, but hopefully at some point we we'll able to take it somewhere. Uh, and the film talks about this. It, I was there for a number of weeks speaking to people, um, filming what was going on in the streets, the assemblies, uh, the incredible use uh, of, of art and music in political expression and dissent in Chile, because uh, music and art have been fundamental. I mean, going back to, you know, even before Allende, because uh, under Allende, the press refused to, to promote him, to carry his message. You know, we might have well, known something about press hostility to left-wing leaders, but um, music and art became fundamental to spreading political discourse, you know, socialist discourse. Uh, you know, you paint a huge socialist message on a wall and thousands of people are gonna see it. You know, you'd send musicians out to the uh, to, to communities um, all over the country and they, they promote the socialist message. And that, that aspect of it was something that I also wanted to focus on in the film. Um, but also, unfortunately, you know, the film shows as well the terrible uh, state repression that's been going on and is going on until today, you know, since uh, just, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in stats, but just to give you an idea, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Chile's National Human Rights Institute released an annual report which covers the protests. Uh, 30 people were died, uh, 30 people were died, 30 people died in the protests, um, some in, uh, killed, others unclear, some killed uh, in by security forces, uh, others causes of death not you know, not quite so clear, but what is clear, 34 attempted uh, homicides, uh, more than a thousand cases of torture, 282 cases of torture with sexual violence, uh, more than 300 eye injuries. So the state repression, this is a, to preserve a neoliberal system that is facing an extraordinarily strong and determined challenge and has completely lost legitimacy. But these are systematic violations being committed against people who are basically demanding, you know, access to health, education, uh, and, a, and a fairer system. They're basically demanding equality, and that's what they've had to. That's what they've had to face. So when you look at that and you think, okay, you know, the left in Britain has taken quite a bashing um, in recent months since, in, well, in the past year, <laughs> well, and before that, but you know, um, you know, Chile. I mean, it, the, the stamina and the commitment and just the the the, the constant pressure uh coming from the grassroots in chile um yes it's it, it, you know and, and considering what they've had to face it's, it's it's a powerful lesson yeah and, and that's just, the film tries to show basically <laughs> yeah i i can't i honestly can't wait and i'll be sharing it with everyone and i think that's when you talk about state repression concentration of power a democracy that is formally 
a democracy, but is actually quite restricted in what it can and can't do. I think people would recognise the last 40 years in this country. I think especially similarly to Chile, implementing what we call Thatcherism, but obviously came in Chile first, there was state repression, there was murder of uh, of striking miners and, and crushing and anti-trade union laws and so forth that are very, very severe. And we are a long distance from that and we're, not, and we're not having people attacked or killed in the same way. But I would like to suggest to the audience that checking out something like Santiago Rising isn't just a exoticism. It isn't just something that's happening in some other part of the world that's interesting. It can directly and it does directly relate to us right here. And if Chile, if that quote is right, that it, neoliberalism was born in Chile and is going to be killed in Chile, then I'd like to be part of that process. And that's something I'd like to promote.